Hi, I'm Adam Wise, application scientist with Andor in the US. You might be familiar with Andor from our wide variety of scientific cameras, spectrometers, microscopes, and other cutting edge equipment for research and testing. Today, I'm going to show off some features from one of our spectrometers, the Chimera 328i. You can see it here. As well as Solace, the control software for all of our cameras and spectrometers. First, what is the Chimera 328i? It's a Cherney Turner spectrometer, focal length 328 millimeters, f over 4.1, with a quad grading turret, and it can be configured with up to two light inputs and two camera or slit outputs. In this video, I'm going to show you the Chimera 328i hardware first, including its unique true res and autofocus features, and then show how the software interface works. I'll show the calibration process, and then basic data acquisition, and then some advanced features. Although I'll be demonstrating Solace, our control software, our cameras and spectrometers can work with many other software packages, probably even the one you're using right now. We have a full compatibility table on our website. I'll try to put up a link here. First, let me show off the hardware. This is the body of the spectrometer. So this is the chassis, quite heavy and stable. And uh, on here, we have the input ports. This is where we bring in the light. This is the direct port meaning it goes directly to the mirror, and I'll show you some more uh, in, about that shortly. And this is the side port. Port selection is motorized and software controlled by a mirror in here that I'll show you also in a minute. I only have one of these ports in use right now, so I'm using the side port, the side input port. But both ports are equipped with manual slits. You can actually see the silver adjustment micrometers here. I only have one input accessory mounted right now, an XY adjustable fiber adapter, but we have a wide variety of accessories that you can see on the Chimera 328i spec sheet. I also have a fiber, an SMA fiber, going to the input port here from this calibration lamp. And this is a mercury argon calibration lamp, which is very useful because it has a wide variety of narrow spectral lines over a very broad spectral range, which is useful as a wavelength calibration standard, and it's conveniently fiber coupled which makes it very easy to set up. So I just attach my, my uh, XY fiber adjuster here, put the ferrule in, tighten it, and then connect it to here, turn it on, and I have a fantastic calibration standard. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have the output ports. So that's where the actual spectrum or image is formed. So this is, on the direct port, a Newton 920 back illuminated full frame high speed CCD. And on the side output port, we have a Xyla 5.5 SCMOS camera here on the side port. I'll only be showing off some basic features of the Newton in this demo, but I have several other videos that highlight the features of some of our other cameras. And I'll take the top off now to show you the optical path inside and some of the features on the inside. So these are some captive fasteners here. We can just kind of unscrew these, make sure they're unscrewed. And that'll provide us access to the inside. And I'm going to reposition this camera to give you a better view of what's going on the inside here. So starting with the fiber over here where the light is coming from, the light comes from the fiber, from the side input here. It passes through a shutter on the inside, which is useful for controlling CCD exposure and then a motorized and computer controllable true res iris, which is right here. I'll use an Allen wrench to point to it. The true res iris allows us to control the F number of the spectrometer and increase the spectral resolution by up to 50% when needed. Normally, I'll have it entirely open, but when required, I can activate it through the software. Then we have a motorized turning mirror here, which controls the port selection. So when this mirror is up, this port is being used. When this mirror is down, this port is being used. It's not a flipper mirror in the sense that it doesn't flip up. It's actually on a computer, or sorry, a, a precision linear translation stage for increased positioning repeatability. So once this mirror is up, it will bounce the light here to the collimation mirror. And at the collimation mirror, the diverging light from the source is brought into a parallel rays, which go to the grating here, the diffraction grating, where the actual work is done. Here, the different wavelengths of light bounce off at different angles. So they bounce off here, hit the focusing mirror, and then those different wavelengths are brought to focus 
either here on the direct port or when the second linear translation stage mounted turning mirror comes up, they'd go to the side port. And again, that's a motorized and computer controllable turning mirror. I should also mention that this focus mirror is on a precision translation stage here. So this mirror can move in and out and control the actual focal length there. So that allows us to control via software an intelligent autofocus feature. Normally focusing is done manually, say at the camera, or potentially not at all. And that's unfortunate because it can reduce resolution if the spectrum is out of focus. And to backtrack a bit, the grating here is on a four position turret. So this turret can turn around 360 degrees on one axis and then tilt to adjust the grating about the face of the grating to reduce any sort of optical aberrations that would be caused by adjusting the grating angle here. So it's actually two rotational degrees of freedom, one here and then one down here. We can hold up the four gratings per turret and there's an RFID chip on the turret that actually tracks which gratings are in there. You can have any number of turrets which are hot swappable and can be accessed through the turret hatch on the cover to keep from exposing the optics unnecessarily. So that's a quick rundown of the inside. If you have additional questions, please feel free to send me an email at a.wise at andor.com or visit the Andor website at andor.oxinst.com, although andor.com will redirect for more information. Now that I've given a quick rundown on the hardware, I'd like to show off the software interface. Let me give a quick introduction. The interface has a lot going on visually, but doing basic data acquisition only requires a small subset and we can access those parts quickly. First, here's the wavelength control. This bar represents the spectrometer's center wavelength. That is the wavelength we are sending to the center of the camera, as well as the highest and lowest wavelengths we can record at the same time. I can either drag the bar around manually and do a grading move, or I can click on the low center or high wavelength and set those manually. So here I'll set a center wavelength of exactly 560.5. And here's the grading selector. I can mouse over to see what gratings are present. And I can click to change the grading. So my current grading is 830 lines per millimeter, blaze 820 nanometers, and I'm going to change that to 150 lines per millimeter at 1250 nanometer blaze. When the grading changes, the wavelength selection bar will respond, showing me the bandpass or range of wavelengths for the currently selected grading. So that'll update as soon as the grading is finished changing. I can also click change turret, and what that will do is move the turret under the turret hatch. That is the, the opening on top of the spectrometer where I can get just the turret out without exposing the rest of the optics. It'll also read the RFID tag at that point and figure out what gratings have actually added to the system. And here you can see the wavelength bar has been updated with a very wide band pass of the low resolution grading. Here, instead of just covering a few nanometers, I'm covering all the way from the ultraviolet to the near infrared in one shot. And here is the simplified camera setup. So I can change the exposure time either by dragging this bar or entering a value directly here. And I can, and I can also see the cycle time. That is, how long does the measurement actually take once you factor in both the exposure time and the time to read out that is to digitize the data on the chip. I can also change the read mode, either full vertical binning, where I'm adding together or binning vertical strips of the entire chip, or image mode, where I'm reading out each individual pixel and constructing an image. I also have multi-track mode, which allows us to add together horizontal strips of data, and I can explain that more in depth later. I can also control all the other motorized components on the spectrometer. The output flipper mirror, the input flipper mirror, shutter, grating, focus mirror, and true res iris over here. And if I had motorized slits of any sort, those would also show up in this. But I have manual slits on this model here, so I'm going to set those manually. I can control all of these things via the GUI, including exposure, a wavelength, and accessories, and so on. Or I can, make, uh, I can quickly write programs in and or basic, our built-in scripting language. So let me demonstrate a quick data acquisition. First, I'll record an image. So I'll set this to image. I'll aim for one of the mercury lines.
record an image. And I notice that I haven't set my input flipper mirror correctly. So I'm going to set that to get light from my fiber optic cable, which is on my side port. My output flipper mirror is fine because I'm recording from the Newton that's on my direct output port. And once I get this in contrast with this button, you can see that I don't have a single core on my fiber. I actually have many cores. This is a multi-core fiber with a feral terminator. And I'm collecting all that spatial information. Although the light coming into each one of these cores from the calibration lamp is from the same source, I could potentially have each one of these cores going to a different point in my experiment. And now that I've taken the image, I can show the FVB mode. So it's going to be like an image, but instead of capturing each individual pixel, I'm going to be capturing columns. So this column will get added up, this column will get added up, and I'll get one spectrum that's all added together at the end. Of course, there's going to be much more signal in any one individual channel, so I can drop my exposure time by quite a bit at that point. So let's see if, if I don't saturate at a very low exposure time. Switch that to FVB readout mode. And to a spectrum view. And I have a spectrum. So now that I've shown the basics of interacting with the camera and spectrometer, I'll show how easy it is to calibrate. So doing online demos like this, I've been constantly taking apart and reassembling the equipment, so it'd be worthwhile to check my calibration. I'm going to pick a calibration lamp line, say the one that I have now, 546.074, I believe, because it's strong and in the middle of the visible spectrum, and set my center wavelength to the nominal value. I already have, so I'm good there. I'll look for my spectral line in the data. I know it's right here, and I know I have two little, uh, uh, a doublet right here, so I can kind of see where I need to be. And I can also visualize the center of the detector with this button right here. So I can see that I'm off a bit. That's where my calibration comes in. What I'm going to do is adjust an offset, and that's a small number that's applied to the actual grading position when I'm making a grading move to some nominal center wavelength. So I can either do that manually, or I can do that using our auto adjust feature. Each individual grading has its own offset that I'll uh, calibrate against, and the detectors have, all their, have their own offset as well. So all I need to do here is auto adjust. And the grading and the spectrometer and the camera will work together to move that to the center of the, the field of view. And we're successful. Now that it's back on, I'm calibrated. There are more ways that you can go deeper with calibration that might even be application specific. So again, if you have questions, feel free to contact one of us or visit our website for more info. The next feature I'd like to show off is our motorized focus mirror. That control is right here. So I'd like to make a manual adjustment, if, or I can make a manual adjustment if I'd like to. So say I'd move this to 200. That'll be quite a jump. And I'm going to uh, quantify the width of these lines. So I'll turn off our, my indicator for the center of the screen, and I'll open up an ROI, a region of interest, focused on that line. I'll add a new ROI. Zoom in on that particular line. It doesn't have to be perfect, but just to make sure I'm excluding other lines. I can see my full width half max calibrated, meaning in nanometers, is about 0.93. So that's saying the full width half max of my line is about 0.93 nanometers when I'm in good focus. If I redo this with my focus that I've purposely moved off, you can see that changes quite a bit. And if I set this to update, you can see now my resolution has, has dropped quite a bit. My full, my full with Fmax, which is a proxy for my resolution, that is my ability to separate two closely spaced spectral lines, which I can no longer do here at this doublet, has gotten quite a bit worse. And the question is, how can I automatically get that back on? If I just hit the autofocus button here, it might take a bit because I've moved it so far off of its, its optimum. The spectrometer, camera, and translation stage in there will work together to adjust my focus to give me the minimum full with half max or the maximum spectral resolution. So using the feedback from the camera, it will find my best focus position.
and you can see the fourth F max changing as it adjusts. It will probably overshoot because it needs to find the minimum. So it'll go a little too far and then come back. But it's found a focus, guaranteeing me the best possible spectral res resolution. And you can see out here it's restored the ability to separate these two lines in this doublet apart. Now that I've shown the basics of the Solace interface, I'd like to show some additional advanced features. The first is our true res feature, which allows the Chimera 328 to operate as a higher resolution, lower throughput spectrometer. I'll start with the true res iris fully open and check the spectral resolution, which I'm going to measure with the full width half max of this line. So I'm going to create an ROI, a region of interest, shrink it to just surround that line, and then note the full width half max calibrated, which is in nanometers. And it looks to be about 1.32 nanometers full width half max of that line. When I restrict this iris, I'll drop this down to about 20 counts. It will act like a much longer focal length spectrometer. And when I take another acquisition here, you can see that the spectral lines have narrowed visibly. And as well, we're down to below one nanometer resolution here. We don't have to use this. We can keep this open all the time. But when we have a relatively bright sample that we require higher resolution from, this can be quite useful. I'm going to open this back up. And our original throughput and resolution is restored. Another feature I'd like to show is step and glue. Step and glue allows us to stitch together many measurements into a single one. And here's the value of this. Right now I'm using a relatively low resolution grading, 150 lines per millimeter. So we're capturing a huge bandpass all the way from the UV to the near IR, but we're doing it with a relatively low resolution. If I switch to a higher resolution grading, say the 830 line per millimeter one, we're going to get a significantly higher resolution, but a much smaller bandpass. And you'll see that reflected in the wavelength control GUI in a second when this grading move finishes. So note this spectral line here and this doublet here. When I repeat my measurement using this other grading with a higher dispersion and a higher rule, that is lines per millimeter, all of a sudden my entire field of view is just those features, this line here and this doublet. But I'm doing that measurement with quite a high resolution because of my larger dispersion. So if I create an ROI, I see that my full width half max is now down to less than a third of a nanometer, about 0.28 nanometers. So what if I wanted to do a very high bandwidth measurement, that is to say cover a large spectral width with very high resolution. Well, this is one option. I'm going to do a step and glue measurement. So to set that up, I'm going to go to the step and glue view here. And open the step and glue dialog. I'll give a start and an end wavelength. Perhaps I'll go a little further into the near IR. And the rest of it I'll leave at the default settings other than the grading, which I want to specify my high resolution grading. Now you can see my range has been broken up into individual measurements that have the bandwidth of a single measurement using the higher res grading. So now if I take data, the software will automatically go to the first position, record a measurement, next position, record a measurement, and automate measurements over the entire range with the appropriate overlap. And we can go through and optimize and change those settings depending on our particular needs. But at the end of that measurement series, what we'll get is a very wide, wide band measurement, but with the resolution of our higher rule grading. And this has a lot of uses uh, in many different applications.